So, 25 hours later, how are you guys feeling? Can you make a sound? Okay. All right, great. Cool. Well, um, congratulations for making it thus far. Um, I am once again uh, very pleased to welcome you uh, to our largest yet hackathon. Um, so that's pretty exciting. A lot of really cool teams, a lot of really intriguing projects. So uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a good day. So before we jump in, uh, I would like to once again just give a shout out to our sponsors, KPF, Autodesk, Human Studio. Thank you very much. We very much appreciate your support. And before we start the presentations, I just want to reiterate uh, the judging criteria for the hackathon projects. So once again, the three things we're focusing on are technology, innovation, and whether or not the project is open source. Uh, technology, once again, uh, we're looking at how technically impressive the hack is. Uh, was the technical problem difficult to tackle? Uh, is there a wow factor that uh, made us all very, very surprised that you actually pulled it off? Innovation, how innovative and groundbreaking uh, was the idea? Did it use a particularly clever technique or did it use any different uh, components? And uh, open source, does your project live on GitHub? Can other people use your work, build on top of your work? Did you share what you've done uh, with the world? And I am also happy to introduce our amazing jurors. Um, I don't think these folks really need an introduction, but I guess that's what you do. So <laughs> um, I'm happy to welcome you here. So first of all, um, Charlie Portelli, one and only, um, from Perkins and Will. Uh, digital innovation specialist, also a beloved former core member. Uh, good to have you back. Uh, David Anders Leon, uh, IAC, director of um, MACAZ program. I, 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 I swear I looked up the disambiguation and I immediately forgot, but um, MACAT, okay, great. Um, and a private consultant, Pablo Zamorano. Pablo Zamorana uh, from Heatherwick Studio, uh, Senior Associate Head of Geometry and Computational Design. Let's give him a round of applause. Ajmal Akhtash from Pratt Institute, uh, Associate Director of the Center for Experimental Structures. And of course, uh, Philip Block, Co-Director at ETH Zurich. All right, so prizes. Um, we're competing in three categories, best overall hack, best open source, and best collaboration. And there's going to be a number of prizes. So you saw the slide yesterday, $100 Amazon gift cards per person, uh, $50 for uh, best overall hack, $50 for best collaborative hack and best open source. Also, uh, Shimizu Corporation were very kind to provide some additional prizes uh, for the teams. So this is some extra excitement for you guys uh, on the side here. And before we jump in, um, just a couple of logistical questions. So I received your presentations earlier. If you send me a Google Doc, check right now whether they're public and whether like all the videos are actually accessible. Just make sure that uh, we can view them. If you want to, uh, present from your own laptop, you're welcome to do so. There's an HDMI cord right here. So if you're doing a live demo, uh, then you can use it. Otherwise, if you're not doing a live demo, uh, feel free to use this machine. So with that said, uh, let's jump in. So first up is the team named Fern E. All right. <laughs> Oh, yes, very important. So actually, so you're the timekeeper, but you guys are going first. Um, you guys have five minutes to present, which we mentioned on Slack yesterday, uh, two and a half minutes for questions. And please, 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 let's stay on time because we will be here forever. Um, but yeah, anyway, thank you guys. I'm the timekeeper and I will cut you off, even in the middle of a sentence. 
So do not go over time. Ready? Hey, how's it going, Chris? How's it going? It's nice going to see great. you. Yeah. Have you seen this cool image that I generated? With this oh my God, that is impressive. I, I really uh, wish that I knew where to buy this thing. I, I know. love to lay out my living room just like this. Yeah, I'm also just wondering, like, what is that sofa? That's, oh, that's that. just a really cool sofa. Yeah. And this or one, that one as well. And, and even like the. the uh, oh, yeah. That would really, oh, that would really bring everything together. I know. Yeah, I wish we could buy that stuff. Oh, actually, now that I think of it, I think, you know, there is an app for that. It's called Fernie. Have you heard of it? <laughs> you mean like the play with the Yoda here? Oh, no. Come on, Chris. Are you serious? No, it's called Fernie. It's the latest and greatest app to find furniture online. So it's actually developed by this incredible team of people. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, they're really experts in the field. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And the problem that the app is trying to tackle is just basically when designers have a mid-journey image uh, with all this incredible ff &E that they're looking for, there's really no easy way to go find that online. So what we're trying to do here is to think of how to cut uh, the constraints and the time that one uses uh, to go from the mid-journey generated image to actual real, real world manufacturers and furniture uh, out there in the world. Um, so let's take a look at what Fernie is. This is the basic interface. Uh, you are prompted uh, as the, the typical mid-journey or DALI uh, interface. You're, you can put in a prompt where you get a series of images, after which you can decide on which image you like the most. Let's say this one, right? It has some pretty good, some pretty cool stuff, but none of this stuff really exists out there, or at least for now. So what we do is we click on the image, and the engine is going to run and detect the elements that it has in the, uh, in the actual scene, and immediately we'll crop the images to find those elements and link us directly to manufacturers and actual products out there online that we can directly click on buy now and get it uh, into our scene. This is another example. This eclectic weird chandelier doesn't exist. Click on it and we have all these like nice Castiglione uh, chandeliers out there that we can uh, go and take a look. So this is our prototype. You give it a room description and it creates one using Dolly. You have a couple of options. You choose your favorite one. And in a couple of sections, you get some product options for that first one having to be the clock. And then you can go click on the link and it takes you to that website. Yeah, and behind the scenes for a rough prototype, uh, we basically process the image first with uh, an object detection model like YOLO. Um, and we use specifically object, uh, art, object classes that are specific to the architecture profession. Um, that uh, generates uh, some cropped images, which are then either um, directly used in image-based searching of the entire web or product catalogs. Um, we are also thinking we can generate image descriptions with each of these images, so we can do text-based search as well. Uh, but in the end, we get these image and product uh, pairings um, based off of the original image in one, one go. This is not just hypothetical. We actually built a, a working prototype. Um, we took the path of uh, using YOLO v5, and then we took the image description path, and uh, we used the Bing API for the search. Um, so what's the future of Fernie? Granted, we just started off, <laughs> but uh, um, we, we hypothesize that beyond ff and &E, is there a way that from these images we can extract even more uh, information? So for example, we think of like maybe for the flooring, uh, any kind of architectural finishes, is it possible to just have those be detected and then link us directly to manufacturers that can help us put that together? And then the designer has more, um, more authority uh, to actually decide. Hmm? And thank you. <laughs> we asked Dolly to generate a, a, a thank you neon sign, and Dolly's not great with text, so. Tiaku. <laughs> all right, and these are the GitHub repos. It's all open source. You can go find the code online. Questions? 
Is there two and a half minutes for questions, right? Okay. Yes, do we have any questions from our jurors? So it's actually not deployed. We we got real close to deploying, but when you try to provision PyTorch environments in in production, it gets quite complicated, and we didn't quite get there at the end. So it's uh, sort of we got it all working locally, um, but we didn't all get get it all tied together in a production environment. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much, guys. All right, next up, um, SA Save GPT. Let's uh, give them a round of applause as well. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we are Save GPT. Uh, we are a big team of 10 people. Uh, we are a merger of different pitches from user projects, but we all had the same problem that is inputting files into JetGPT in a safe manner. So we ended up on this product of secure and anonymizing our information, filtering it for JetGPT. So mainly uh, defining a problem, our objectives, what solutions uh, we provided, and the method and what's the future for this. So as I'm saying, we wanted to up upload text documents to the JetGPT platform, but um, typical uses most of us here must have used uh, JetGPT for different uses, but analyzing text, verifying content, revising language, creating new proposals. But for many of us in the AC industry, uh, we know NDAs and that's not a possibility. So we needed um, to create something in between our text document that would anonymize certain information that we want out there uh, to bring into JGBT. So it is how we do it. So before uh, describing kind of under the hood how we uh, came about with the solution, we're just going to do a quick demo so you can see what's going on. So this is our safe GPT application. As you can see, it allows the user to upload a document and then specify certain terms like location or uh, person, meaning you know names of individuals and so forth, that the user wants to be anonymized. Uh, that document is then sent to chat DPT in an anonymous way. And then the user can uh, send questions. Uh, and those questions will come back uh, anonymized so that none of the information that is sensitive that you want chat GPT not to see is ever exposed to it. So it gives you a functioning chatbot with the power of chat GPT without the worry that you're disclosing sensitive information. Yeah, right. So uh, a little bit of just kind of the technical background. Um, if you're like me, you came into this event not knowing a lot about large language models. Uh, so ChatGPT is a large language model uh, that is able to interpret human text uh, and give you responses in natural language. Uh, it is not the only large language model, though. There are other language models that you can deploy locally. So the question is, why do we need ChatGPT? Well, as the name implies, it's a large model. ChatGPT requires a lot of data and a lot of power to run. So it runs on a cloud with a huge GPU. Um, alternatively, there are local models that you can deploy, but they are not as powerful and not as capable. So a local model uh, would protect your privacy if you were using it as a chatbot on your local machine. Um, and it is powerful enough perhaps to do things like identifying names and entities. Um, but it is not powerful enough to do really uh, powerful document analysis. So you couldn't, for example, give it a document and say, summarize this, you know, give me an executive summary. Um, ChatGPT, on the other hand, is powerful, but it's not private. So our goal was to kind of harness the best of both worlds. Uh, and the way this would work is that we have our safe GTP app, J GPT app, which will identify entities in your document, anonymize them. That is then the text that gets sent to ChatGPT. So you're protecting the information you need to protect, but also harnessing the full power of ChatGPT. Uh, this works with queries as well. So here's just a screenshot of, uh, of the application that you saw earlier. And as you can see here, the user has provided a document they want to ask ChatGPT something about. They've specified a series of entities that they want anonymized, in this case, location and email and phone and so forth. At that point, the user is able to pose a question. For example, who can help me with this proposal if I have additional questions? Um, our application anonymizes that question, sends it to ChatGPT. 
ChatGPT will give you a response. And you can see here we have person two, phone 13, email one. So it's giving you a response with those anonymized terms. And then our application will decode that for you so you can read the answer with the original names and, and uh, you know numbers and information. Uh, the next steps for this, this is currently live on GitHub. It's ready to use in the form you know we showed. Um, I don't, let me back up for a sec. The current uh, terms that we have that it's able to recognize are things like company, entities, addresses, emails, names of individuals, as well as phone numbers. So the future development would be to expand that to be able to anonymize additional entities or terms, such as quantities, costs, dates, and times, and that sort of thing. Um, but we've built it in a modular way that those can just be added in over time. Um, of course, this wouldn't uh, have been a success without the great team behind it. Uh, as we mentioned, we're a pretty large team uh, coming from a variety of locations and backgrounds. We span the globe pretty well. Um, but we were able to divide into a number of subgroups to you know, make sure everybody was participating um, and involved in the project. Um, just to close out, we'd really like to thank uh, persons three through four who helped do the coding, person five and six who put the presentation together, and especially a big thanks to company one for hosting this event and bringing us all together. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, guys. Also, Ben just reminded me that as a global leader in innovation, company one does, in fact, have more than one microphone. So um, yeah, I have to press the button to make it work. But yeah, if you guys have questions. Uh, green should be green. OK, so just to kind of um, summarize the process. So you upload the document, and then you have that little filter dropdown where you put in loc and purse and that sort of thing. And those are the filters that anonymizes a document, right? OK, cool. And a user may, for example, not want to anonymize certain information. So maybe they don't want to change names of people, but they want to change locations or something like that. So that the user can choose which items get anonymized. And then it seems like you figured out the reverse process too. So once you get the, the chat GPT text back, that's right. You it can re-correlate it, it back. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, that, that would go in the future development category, yes. Uh, yeah, this is just for text-based uh, you know, documents currently. But yeah, certainly if you wanted to be able to do visual um, you know, AI chat, you would need an application similar to ours to interpret images that way. So, uh, for images, we thought about that, but I think the right way to do that would be to uh, identify objects in the image and then cover them in white space. Uh, that would be the right way, but that was not possible in 24 hours, so we thought, you know, it's the best MVP we have. I have a question. Um... So since you are you're modifying the query with this by supplanting these sensitive information with with some uh, wildcards, no? Right. Uh, doesn't that affect the query also? Potentially it could, but the intent was that uh, those white cards that it replaces with are something that ChatGPT can still understand. So it still understands, you know, that this is a person or that this is a location, so that it can give you, you know, answers back that are sensible rather than just replacing it with dummy text or redacting it. Right. That's the big key. It's not redacting your document; it's anonymizing it. It's it's on GitHub. Pointer to it. Yeah, it's on GitHub. As a, as a proof of concept, uh, we wanted to test it, so we pre-anonymize file by hand to be able to share files from our companies to test it. So that wrote it. <laughs> yeah, we just discovered this thing doesn't beep. So <laughs> anyway, all right. Thank you so much, guys. Is that, oh, that's them. Okay, perfect. And uh, yeah, next up, uh, AC Academy. Let's uh, give them a shout.
Okay. Do you guys, oh, did you guys just want to do it from this? Or? Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Yes. Did you guys wow. need a mouse? Okay. Oh. We do have. We have okay. that technology. If, 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 you, if you stuck on one of the slides, then, then go. Get out of the presentation on your computer. Oops. It's because you're on it. It's Someone's with switch. Like, okay. Someone's yeah. Okay. Do you guys wanna? Do you guys wanna figure it out and then uh, come back? Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. <laughs> All right, wouldn't have been a hackathon without technical issues, so that's all good. In that case, um, building Forge, come on up. You guys are around, right? <laughs> okay, great. I, I don't have any jokes to tell, so, but that's okay. Great, here we go. Hi, my name is Shay Kuziak. Um, I come from Join, a uh, collaborative pre-construction platform. Um, the topic I'm presenting, it's called Building Forge and it's humanities only real-time construction pricing, pricing engine for planning. Um, so this project was a collaboration between TestFit and Join the team comprised of Clifton and Ryan from TestFit and Dan, Jules, Tim, and myself from Join. So a little bit about Join for those of you who haven't heard. Um, it is a collaborative decision-making platform for the built environment, and it aims to align stakeholders on uh, cost changes to their projects as well as schedule impacts. And it really aims to uh, dismantle the siloed current model of the design bid build process that's uh, going on. So by bringing in construction expertise earlier into the project. So coming into this project, we wanted to align three major components of the two platforms, which are the design and concept iteration of TestFit with the historical construction cost data that JOIN offers, as well as scenario viewing that JOIN also offers. Um, so the scope of the project was to plug together the two platforms with JOIN's first uh, hack at a public API. And with this, we will hope to get instant accurate cost feedback for proposals. And now for the demo. I'm gonna do in here, okay. Okay, so to start the demo, we are looking at test bit and we're looking at a model for a hospital project, the First Liberty Medical Center. And if you've used test fit before, you might know that you are able to create multiple configurations for uh, an individual project so that you can analyze them on building performance, uh, revenue, um, lots of different metrics. So if I click into the statistics here, I'm able to see project data and financial data about uh, the current model. And then what's new here is this new button for join.build. So we are able to sync 
uh, this current model and its different configurations with join. So I click this button, sync to join, and then we will tab over to join. And right now I'm looking at a report uh, that join offers, which is um, based on that same first uh, medical center project. And we will accept those models from join. So I'll click link to test fit. And I begin my import process of the first Liberty Medical Center. So I select the model or the project rather. And then I uh, accept the three different configurations of models. And then my next step is to pull historical projects that we have within JOIN. So all of their cost information, their estimates, their budgets, uh, and what have you. So adding those to re the report, we are able to see the three historical projects that we will just configure so that we can uh, leverage those historical projects to review the different uh, test fit models. So selecting a similar categorization amongst the three projects. And then in this view, I'm also generating a historical average. So this is the key here. Um, we are able to see the average for each of these individual building components that we can then flip to the model view. And then based on the scope that was pulled out of test fit for uh, you know, various hospital areas, clinic, common space, elevator, um, lobby criteria. So pulling the, that information from test fit, we are able to apply the historical cost averages to those models. And then we are able to see roughly where the models are um, amongst, amongst those averages. And then based on the three different configurations, configurations, we are able to choose a preferred model that we can move forward with and continue on in our planning exercises. Um, yeah, that's the end of the demo. Great. <laughs> Any questions? I have a question. So uh, uh, quite interesting. Um, I'm just wondering, um, whether it's, uh, so at the moment, all the, the kind of the financial information is, is getting from kind of past projects. Um, I'm curious to see how it's kind of projecting uh, the, the changing costs uh, in the future and whether uh, there is any kind of outside, let's say architecture, uh, kind of sources of uh, financial sources that you know are taken into consideration for trends. Yeah, so what we have currently in JOIN is the ability to apply uh, an RS means index to our historical projects that brings them into current day. So you can uh, apply an average for, or I'm oh, sorry, you can apply a escalation index to uh, let's say a project that's in Houston versus New York City. You can apply uh, an index to that. And then you can also do that for, you know, so a project from 2019, you can uh, bring it to current day pricing. Um, and then, yeah, I think there's a good bit of like uh, data mining of historical projects that can be used, you know, maybe in the future of not necessarily uh, needing to only use your projects, but be able to leverage other people's anonymized uh, construction cost data. Uh, thank you. Uh, great presentation. Um, I feel like you, there's a lot more to unlock here and potentially talk about because it's such a substantial area of, of interest, especially of mine. But uh, it, it seemed like the project that you were pushing for simulating the cost was very modular. And the three projects, uh, I guess there were also hospitals, uh, maybe portions that were modular. How do you differentiate between conventional versus uh, modular construction? That's a good point. I think the what what a big part of this project, what we're struggling with is kind of aligning those breakouts. So if you don't have the exact breakout in your estimate that you potentially have in your test fit breakdown, um, it's really hard to align those costs. So there's kind of a lot of like going back into the estimate and recategorizing so that you can get meaningful data out of it. Um, 
yeah, there's, there's a, it's really quite complicated to map all of those things together. Thank you so much. All right, so um, A Academy do not get excited because we're gonna go out of order a little bit because some people have planes to catch. So, so um, I would like to welcome uh, the folks from Boring. Don't just start, don't just start. Wait, wait, wait for it. Where is Nick? <laughs> I, mean, I don't say anything because she's just waiting for me to start a timer. Okay, um, we're gonna say this is gonna get boring, so you might wanna grab some extra coffee. Um, but that's not true. It's been pretty amazing for us the last uh, 24 hours or whatever it's been. Um, you can see the group here that's come together. We represent architects, designers, kind of from all over the globe, software developers. Um, and we just wanted to take this simple idea that Mustafa put out there of lists being boring and kind of jump into it. So. We've all kind of been here. You have a model, you want to push it to something else. No one is named anything the same or to your standard or to the standard that you want to push to. Uh, and when you have to rename all this stuff, it's pretty boring. Um, and with all the amazing magical AI that's out there, like, can we just rename stuff? That would be kind of magic. Um, so that's what we want to try and do is automatically normalize room names to space types because everything you see just from what you know you talk to join people right after this cost uh, analysis LCA all these things uh, can become possible and that's what we want to move into so uh, we built some stuff these get these folks built some stuff uh, and that's what we're going to show oh lastly this is kind of how it works. Um, you have design tools that designers are already using, Rhino, Revit, Excel. There's dynamic room names. That means rooms that are not named correctly. Um, we have the boring machine, not to be confused with someone else's boring machine. Um, and that gives you a boring room name that then can be pushed into all these other tools. So without further ado. Okay, thank you. So these are some of the boring technologies that we made. So the first thing is a boring website. You just go, you just select what's the building type that you have. It has some program type. This comes from the ASHRAE uh, standard for energy modeling. It basically finds, reads those, and then says, okay, that was the real room name. These are the boring names that I found for you, and this is how much I'm confident. So you can see the confidence, you can filter, and you can see them in 3D also. And then if you like it, you can save it and continue uh, fixing the problem, then that was boring, but when it comes into Revit, it's not boring. So the same thing in Revit, the same app. This time, is, this is a famous residential. We have only three program uh, room types, so it doesn't match perfectly, but it still gets me 40% there, right? For Revit, we still don't have the thing to go back to Revit, but again, uh, you can download this, go to the next boring tool, Rhino. So in Rhino, we have more, right? This is, a, this is the famous one, medium office didn't work well, large office, 63%, right, right? Now you check, and this is actually a pretty good job. Like most of them, all the restrooms are correct, everything is good. But the good thing is now you can replace that model. So that model initially didn't have any construction, sorry, any program type, anything. Now you have a full energy model with everything assigned to it. I know you don't believe me. This is it, right? all the program types uh, and it comes with lighting, everything. So you can see just how the lighting looks like here. Uh, so this is good, but then some people say, ah, it's good, but the ones that were like 20%, I don't like them, you're messing up my model. So there is a 
minimum acceptance confidence, I call it acceptable confidence again. Okay. And then I say anything that is less than 40%, I don't want. You see all those non things, so you can go and manually fix the less boring stuff. And here's another boring project. Yeah, so another uh, boring part of the process is trying to figure out what's in the library. So you can search through that. And we expanded the test case to see if this semantic matching can work on with sentences and finding construction systems. And we got a live demo and a clock that's really angry at me. But you know this tool, this is one is pretty boring and not everything is about environmental simulation. Sometimes it's just as boring as just architectural name. So we build a boring tool. Um, I'm just uh, close this console log, but you know, the drill like labeling is very boring in Revit, but you know, sometimes you are a firm and you have some sort that you can benchmark. You can also benchmark against ASHRAE. I, I guess that's um, Mustafa's problem. Then the AI, the AI is gonna uh, think. Sometimes it gets like pretty right on the assignments. You can all, of course override, uh, okay, 15 seconds. I'm very happy to say that we do write back to Revit. So if you save this and look into one of these rooms, you get a boring name and it's dining. So you can move on to other systems as well. Um, and I guess um, that's it. I just want to thank you all. And yeah. Oh, and you can check the code for these app on GitHub. Of course, thank you. Any questions from our jurors? <laughs> so, you know, creative names are problematic. Boring names are easy to work with. So think about it as like all these names that people put in is creative. We want to have different, everyone can have their own boring names. The boring names for us matches the program types of ASHRAE. The boring name for those guys matches their own benchmark naming. And I think the beauty of this system is you say, these are the creative names. This is the boring names that I want. And basically it maps them to the best boring name that they can find for you from your boring names. And the beauty is my boring name and their boring name doesn't need to match. Because when we initially started, we thought like they should use my boring names, but they don't have to. Just give me your boring name and I map your boring name to my boring name. And mapping your boring names to my boring names is much easier than doing your creative names to my boring name. Does it make sense? It's a boring thing in the middle that makes everything easier. <laughs> the other thing that we tried and we didn't have the opportunity to show is like you can also type in another language. So we are, we are from Denmark and we were naming rooms in Danish and they all just worked it out. Yeah, this one. And night night bucks, night bucks that and night bucks that was that's what we pay. Yeah, so the whole web app uh, was built during the weekend. We do have a good framework at the firm to host web apps inside Revit, and that's not open sourced. Um, so that sped up our communication with Revit. And Mustafa Stack also has been built for a while. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, amazing. I think I got the order figured out now. Um, you say Academy, are you guys ready? Okay, perfect. Let's uh, welcome them. I guess that's a sort of a stage, but yeah, welcome them to the stage.
Um, hello, everyone. This is a team of Academy. Uh, we are a group of uh, designers uh, from the city. Um, so the problem we're trying to solve is we came from uh, uh, educational background where there are minimal overlap between the years. And so it had been a difficult challenge to like found a solution or to share some knowledge across an, uh, the year boundaries. And after the students come into the uh, professional world, like they have the realization that something should have been taught in school earlier, or maybe you are on the other side of the table on this conversation, like the, the new junior you hire recently, doesn't meet your expectation. So if only there's a way we can travel back in time and have those knowledge when we are younger, right? So the idea is we're gonna cross source the knowledge and across the generation of the, the young engineers, um, young de designers. Um, and this is tailored toward the student community by which uh, the students or the young graduates can submit their models, scripts, whatever skill set they would like, like to share. Uh, and we met, make that whole process shareable through sketch on a phone, essentially making your mobile phone as an external uh, working surface. This is me. I'm a student and, you know, I'm doing a poor internship and the, you know, the person, my boss says these kids these days, they don't know anything. And he's right. I don't know anything. So good thing I have Academy and I have this handy Rhino plugin that allows me to scan and connect to uh, a web server. So here I can go on my phone from that and just draw a sketch. And from that sketch, it uses a search engine to where I can link to the hub. I can select the file types that I'm looking for. Uh, and then it links to the most relevant um, file types. So if I want images, if I want models, if I want scripts, uh, these are all linked to me, all based on the sketch that I gave it. Uh, so we can look for a, a facade. And now that I've downloaded these files and I've downloaded the information that I need, uh, I now know something. So we're good to go. Demo. So here's a demo of the prototype that we've got. So let's say you're in Rhino, you're stuck. So you open up the plugin, you scan the QR code, and you can make your sketch of um, this detail that you want to do. So from the sketch, you can already um, retrieve the information. But if you think that you know a bit of text prompt that you can actually put into it, then you can use our prompt panel to go more in depth. So for example, you think it's something that is a facade component, you can type it in and you can even go into more advanced prompt. So you can go from file name, author name, category, ratings, and so on. So for example, you want a grasshopper file and then you go in and search and let the plugin do its work. When it's ready, it generates a bunch of resource, uh, results. So for example, this one, you can preview it to see if it's something you want. You can even upload and contribute more to it if you would like. But if that's not what you want, you can go into another one and see a quick preview of the file to see if it's what you want. And if it is, then you can download it, which gets directly sent back to your Rhino file. And then from this plugin here, you can open it. So if it's a grasshopper file, you can retrieve it from here. And then you can start using it. So, sorry. Since um, this is a hackathon, definitely somebody gonna be interested in what's the back end, how's the workflow being achieved. So basically this application has been like hosted online and um, we are using Azure Blob for the object uh, storage. So basically there's no limit what kind of the thing you wanna share. And then we are trying to solve the issue that how can you search all of this? Like we are assuming there's so many data you're gonna input. Uh, basically we are trying to build a search engine and definitely I, I feel like there's a hard time to search like our Beam library, the Revit families, because like the file name is not being well named. So we are doing something like we are doing the image based search. That means like we convert the image using some like AI tools. 
so far is the uh, ChatGPT API. We convert it into a string and then we label it using the KN search to find the closest one. Then that's how it works. All right, thank you. And just one other thing, right? So this is uh, actual working things. We have this iPad here. Um, you can scan the uh, QR code we show. Everybody can just draw something and we know your idea. We're gonna make the library bigger, all right? All right. Um, well, amazing. I think it actually makes me think much beyond the, the scope of of the you know of the of education, no? because um, somehow you're talking about data classification of uh, geometrical models, you know? and these models might have uh, obviously sometimes much more than much much many more dimensions than those you can that you can identify. You no, know? my my question is basically. And there, you, you you were explaining in the end of in the end slide uh, about the technology stack that you use for this, and I'm not uh, I don't really understand how do you actually um, how do you actually identify the elements in in the in the models that part no yeah this part right yes so basically we just learned like two days ago from the master class right the elastic class. So we indexing all the images by like using a uh, sense, uh, sentence transformer API to make it like a human, uh, computer readable like string. And then we're using the KN search. It's not like an AI tool, it's more like a hard code algorithm to compare like the, um, your search input to the label. And then we probably just show like the top five results. Then this is the best search result you get. Sure, but from the model, Right from those models, how do you, um, you know, how do you know from that model that that's a window? For instance, that's my that's my question. No? Yeah, because like this guy, the ChatGPT AI thing is reading all the sketch and tell us what's inside. So it's kind of a miracle, but you can try it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll definitely. I mean, I as as I said, I think that for processing data beyond the scope, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Next up, uh, yes, thank you. Next up, XRVZ. Thank you. Okay, so you want to hear your. Hi everyone. We're uh, you can pronounce this however you want. We I'm gonna say service. Um, it's gonna sound like service maybe. That's kind of cool. People like service. Um, so we're a team of uh, very inter interdisciplinary people. None of us knew each other prior going into this. Um, let me go ahead and advance. Uh, so we are architects, application developers, software engineers, computational designers, uh, VDC directors, and UI UX designers. We're all different kinds of folks. Um, well, we're all just big nerds. Um, so would you like to present the big idea? Uh, the, well, the, the big idea was uh, to build a cross-platform uh, web app that can be viewed in any uh, AR or VR device uh, using the technologies of uh, WebXR. Um, so we had a, uh, a big brainstorming session and tried to think about all of the, all the ins and outs and um, uh, I guess pros and cons. Uh, and the, uh, the, the reasons to, uh, to do this sort of thing. Um, and then also thought about the other tools that are out there that, uh, you know, they, they do a good job of uh, being able to get you into a VR space, um, uh, but they all cost money 
And uh, frankly, in, in, in my experience, at least, it's always been a challenge to you know, deploy it and share something with, with people. So what, what we were trying to do is make this uh, free and easy to jump into a space um, using uh, an, an open uh, kind of foundational technology of the web. Um, you can see here uh, WebXR is being supported by a whole bunch of frameworks, um, but it is not fully supported by all of the devices. So that is one challenge that we ended up facing. And one of the biggest desires like that, when you're sitting down with a client, you're like, just open up the model. Like it should be just that simple, regardless of, of software or web hosted model. So here are a bunch of different things that this uh, actually can interact with. Uh, we built it uh, uh, over the last couple of days just for Forma, because that's how our team was comprised. But it, it can also interface with things like Hypar or any other web hosted uh, 3D model uh, or 3D modular space for that matter. Um, and also uh, its best application, uh, we believe, is, is uh, in the sort of visceral uh, understanding of the analysis of some of these models and, and uh, really getting people in a more tactile and immersive way to understand the, the space and the, and the design. Um, so again, just you know, a couple of positive and negatives of, of XR. Um, people have their own opinions on this. I, I, I personally love it. I think it's tons of fun. Um, I, I, I'm a huge Skyrim VR guy. I, I love a good modded game. Um, but uh, there are lots of folks that you know this isn't the right thing for, so it needs to be uh, approachable in a lot of different ways, and, and people should be able to interact with it in their preferred method. Yeah, it's a mixed yeah. bag. Um, so it just uh, real quick, we wanted to map out a, uh, what is possible in our time limit, what is not possible in our time limit. I, ideally, we would also be able to have people synchronize their view between their different sessions of, of uh, instances within the, the XR space, um, gain uh, uh, some sort of uh, like actual sound mapping, allowing for markups, uh, having some more uh, rapid analysis more embedded within the UI, like within a VR headset, you can just like click run this analysis, um, stuff like that. Uh, so this is ultimately the the elevator pitch of, of the, the product. I'm probably going to keep speeding along because I know we have a demo. Um, here are some of the tasks that we're trying to undertake within the time limit. Uh, really, the biggest part of it was this left side of actually physically building the tool. Um, here are some of the processes that we underwent. Uh, first, taking uh, into the uh, WebXR platform to try and like build some 3D space and have it link in properly to, to Forma. This is like a, a little plug-in, a little proof of concept moment. Um, some of the big struggles that we had was just understanding the differences in 3D space between uh, Forma and, and XR. Yep. Okay. Is that coming from the screen? Just a mo. Okay, there you go. So that's within the headset at the moment. Here, uh, we've got a uh, we've got a a live website um, launching soon. Uh, XRVZ.app. Everybody can can go and see what we've done. Uh, we've got a web app here that has nothing in it because Forma doesn't um, yet support getting uh, models out of Forma. And then we've got a model, an extension for Forma that I would love to show you, but we are out of time. Yeah. OK, yeah, yeah. Uh, any questions so as we pull up the demo? I'll, uh... Yes. <laughs> That's a good question. On that, uh, 
There it is. A beautiful NBBJ building. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. We have a minute left for questions. These are directly from Forma. So this would work for essentially any project within Forma. So since I'm from that team and we've started building out an SDK, this only uses geometry that's available via the SDK. So this is also all open source and yeah, anyone can build this. It looks nice with the analysis right now because we didn't have time to properly build out the texture, but this fits perfectly within the site limit or the boundaries. So that's why it looks like this. But if you have another one, then it would look like shit. What do you think will be the best case scenario to use this? Uh, frankly, it's it's uh, in a conversation with a client where you're trying to like have them uh, understand like in a sun path analysis or in a in a sound analysis like this one, like where are my problem spots? Where where am I going to get good light? And like actually see that what that view is from inside the model. That's it. Oh, I got it. All right. Amazing. Thank you so much. And let me find my bearings. Okay. Environmental simulation for dummies. <laughs> Thank you, Sergey. Okay. We have it. Uh, just click on it. Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. So, the main issue that we wanted to try and address with environmental simulation for dummies is that. Grasshopper has been around over a decade. It's very clear at this point that most of our offices are not going to learn Grasshopper. Yet there are very important things that we are environmental analyses that we are doing in Grasshopper that we want everybody to be able to do easily and quickly. So the question we want to answer is, can we use our nice, cleanly organized Python SDK that is open source for Ladybug tools and the awesome Python editor and packaging system that Asan has built into Rhino 8 to turn our most common Grasshopper workflows into Rhino commands that people can run uh, in you know, two or three easy steps and we can write in less than 100 lines of Python code. So the way that it works is that instead of, let's say, dropping a sun path onto the canvas of a Grasshopper script, you just type LBT sun path. It asks you for an EPW weather file path or a URL to a weather file, which we can just grab from our, our uh, EPW map interface of weather files. You just paste that into the command prompt, and that's all that you need to get a sun path in, shown up in your Grasshopper canvas or in your Rhino scene, uh, right, that you can then use on your project. And because we're using our Ladybug Tools SDK, all the customization that you can do in Ladybug Tools with that visualization, you can do with options on the Rhino command. Right, so if I want a stereographic sun path with dry bulb temperature plotted on top of that, I can use that just by tweaking the options on the command. Right, so all that power is there, and this is all with 150 lines of code in this case, which could probably be even less with, with a few tweaks. So right, and the use cases of this, right, you have a sun path, you just type LVT sun path. If you want to show the project manager, uh, you're going to get glare on the east and west sides of your building, and you use those options to tweak the origin of, the, of that sun path. You can change the scale. Right, so it's actually making a meaningful uh, communication tool, uh, right, without having to open up Grasshopper, open up a whole script, you just run a command and you can see that very quickly and easily. Uh, and of course, the dream is that it's not just about doing our nice climate graphics like sun paths, but right, you can run it whole studies. So you just type LBT direct sun. Uh, it will ask you, let's say, for what day, what month, uh, or let's say what series of months you want to run it for using those command options. It'll show you those sun positions that you're running the sun study for and ask you for the poly surfaces or meshes that you then want to run that study for. All uh, right, you select those. You can change the grid size, let's say, through the options. It'll show you the grid of where it's going to run that sun study analysis. And then, right, you just uh, select the context geometries that, let's say, can block the sun. Uh, right, and with all that done uh, in just a few, you know, three steps, pretty much three easy steps, you just hit enter and it runs the direct sun study for you, it gives you a nice legend, uh, right, so you can use this very quickly to evaluate your building massing in this case. 
Uh, and because it's using our Ladybug Tools SDK, it's not only that we can just write it with 150 lines of code, um, right? It's also that uh, it has all the efficiencies and things that we've worked into the Ladybug Tools SDK, right? So if you want to run the direct sun study for just all the geometry together, right? We've already optimized all the workflows for meshing this, for like running this through uh, through the, the simulation process, uh, right? So you can do this pretty quickly and easily with just a few seconds uh, to get a full, um, Full sun study of a whole urban area, like in this case, and yeah, just just wait for it. There we go. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of the. Yeah. Uh, nice. Um, so th there's no grasshopper in the background, right? No, no there's no grass. Just just Python is okay, right? Um, just pure Python. Just yeah. a question: How would uh, what would be the, the advantages of this versus using something like, for example, like Grasshopper Player, where you sort of can create commands and run Grasshopper scripts? Oh, I, I guess I mean the very nice thing I, I guess is that you can package this, especially with the Rhino's new packaging system. Just deploy it as a plugin to everybody in your office, uh, right? So and and again, it's using like Rhino's native structure. Like everybody who uses Rhino is going to be familiar with commands already and how to run those. Uh, right, so just by following that, you know that that step, they don't necessarily need to know Grasshopper. They can they can access the capabilities of these types of studies. Thank you. Okay, I think it's uh, really useful. Uh, opens kind of the, the tool to everyone that is not a specialist. Uh, I think that's what I believe. Um, we just spend a lot of time actually doing this in the studio as well. I'm just wondering, is this open? Uh, so. So the, we're going to be putting a lot of these commands into our into our paid plugin, but we are our software development kit is completely open source, and we will be putting a lot of methods in there so that you can write your own commands and distribute your plugins. Uh, you know, we're going to support you as much as we can with that. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess I should say this: these two commands that I wrote here are open. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but that's that's where we're going. We want to make it very easy for everyone here to to just you know not even uh, like a hundred lines, but just like with twenty lines, if we if we've taken care of the repetitive stuff of these that's needed to format these Rhino commands. Yes, thank you. So if I'm interested in a generative uh, analysis where I might have to leverage Grasshopper. Uh, what happens then? So I, I mean, okay, yes. At a certain point, right, you're going to hit the limitations of a you know a command line interface like this, and yeah, and you may need a Grasshopper script for that. No, I mean, it's not to say there's a lot you could still do in Python, right? Like there's a lot of automation and generation you can do purely with the Python. Well, uh, could we add a, a generative? Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Itself. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, because yeah, you have access to all of Rhino Common and all of the the best things of our libraries there. All right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so next, uh, let's hear from the good folks at Collab. Hello. Oh, hi. Uh, hi, everyone. So we are uh, clap rate on the cool app, so the building doesn't collapse. Um, all right. So I'm going to start this presentation with a question. How do we do a schematic design for a building? Do not swipe away yet. Hear me out. So we have architects who use the softwares, uh, tools, whatsoever, and we have engineers who use these tools. We use all sorts of different tools. We speak different languages. When I ask my architects to send me a column, they always send me like a well-modeled three-dimensional geometry with fireproofing on it, and all I wanted was a line. So how do we how so how do we do a schematic design for a building? Now, question is maybe we can speak the same language. So say that this topic came up a lot during this whole event. And let's see. Traditionally, this is how our industry transfer data. Like, I ask you to send me something, you send me something completely different. That's how we do things. And then we're thinking, maybe we could have a pool of data, and then everyone just extract whatever you want, and then this communication would be, there's no misunderstanding anymore. Um, so maybe then it's, it's, it's information now. It's not and just, just a data. So 
I'll pass that on to Alex. Thank you. So uh, what you see here is our first uh, brainstorming sketch of how you would uh, actually implement the project. Um, what we did is we used uh, the Victor uh, platform, uh, which allows to code web apps using Python as the central hub and connected various disciplines to it. To it. So uh, first of all, um, creating geometry in a structural grid using a crossbar model running on ShapeDiver. Um, actually, uh, we also wanted to place it into reality using uh, 3D photorealistic tiles, which we're going to hear about, calculate wind loads, do seismic analysis, structural analysis, and also put some on optimization on top of it. Um, the first step in the, what you can see here is a screenshot of the app that uh, involves several steps. The first one is actually choosing the location um, of the project, then um, uh, actually generating the geometry using Grasshopper model running on ShapeDiver. That, uh, so Victor calling actually um, the Grasshopper model and placing the geometry um, into the scene and also extracting a structural model, which is used for the further uh, analysis. Yeah. So with your model created through Grasshopper, uh, another fun thing we're able to include is a 3D visualization tab. So we use Google's API together with CZM.js uh, to place photorealistic 3D tiles that uh, create a, an interactive map. So you can rotate, zoom, and all that fun stuff with your model inside the 3D space to give the user visual context for their building. Um, so we already had the latitude and longitude set from the previous steps. So you know where your building's gonna go. Uh, and we can just pull those within Victor to place our uh, building. And then uh, we grab the correct 3D tiles using Google's API, uh, and then we render them in this view. Uh, a side note is that using New York City during development was not maybe the most efficient thing. There are a lot of buildings here, and uh, it, things took a long time to load while we're developing, but we got it to work in the end. Um, the only thing we weren't able to do uh, is to resolve some object origin and target issues. Uh, the GLTF object from Rhino had a different, it was pointing to a different place, and then our cesium uh, rendering was a different target. We couldn't quite get them to coincide, but we did some blue beam magic to show you. Um, what our app currently does, it does the, it renders the environment correctly. The model renders correctly. It's just not superimposing. So we just showed you where the uh, model would render if we could resolve those target issues. We got 95% of the way there and that last error we just couldn't resolve. Okay, I have 30 seconds. Uh, so now we have the location of the building. We have the footprint or the input parameters from Victor. We did some uh, basic structure analysis. So we did some wind load calculations, uh, uh, some optimization using uh, evolutionary uh, genetic algorithm. And then finally, uh, sent the model to ETABS using uh, a worker by uh, Victor. So the worker is installed on a remote machine. And then through the web interface, you're able to invoke that machine and run your model. And then also we did some global optimization on Victor also using some of the Python functionality. So here's the GitHub uh, link. Everything's open source. And these are our members. Thank you. Yes. Yes, it is. Oh, I mean, I forgot to mention that. There should be, okay, there, there's no link. It, it was published. Okay, but it should be published on the Victor uh, platform. So Victor's uh, is like the front end. And then once you enter your inputs, it goes to ShapeDiver, which uses Grasshopper in the back end, does all the computations, sends it back to Victor. And then from Victor, we go to structure analysis, everything else. 
Yes, yes, yes. All right, well, thank you so much. Now, more amazing things are awaiting us from It Takes a Village. Are you guys using yours? Or? Right. So if you remember our pitch from like 27 hours ago, uh, we are pitching about collaboration and connecting different platforms. So this year, it's super exciting because we have a lot of software companies and different platforms that actually arrived to the, to the event. And we wanted to take this opportunity to start aligning uh, API layer and basically finding use cases of how to enable different products, different platforms to, to work together. So you can basically use the platform, the tool that is best for the job and then transition smoothly to the other environment. And the trick with platforms is that basically you can do anything. <laughs> so we had to find a, a case study and the thing that uh, basically would be driving our development. The uh, project that we agreed on and we were following was somehow very, very similar. Uh, similar to the one we just uh, saw before. The idea was to play around with generative design um, and uh, basically take some geometry logic, parametric logic, and optimize it with environmental analysis, structural analysis, and to generate many options, being able to score them, uh, to generate, uh, to basically select the one that is the best, or a couple of them that are the best, and then produce some kind of reporting with uh, renderings and statistics that would go into the report, but also that you can transition those options further into your design process. Sure, so um, we started off by uh, um, taking all these different developments and uh, giving it to different responsible uh, uh, developers or irresponsible developers. <laughs> And uh, we just started building and we were like, uh, and uh, there were some that said, okay, but I also want to join and also want to contribute. And like, okay, well then just build something and uh, we can uh, stick this together one way or another. It uh, made for a marvelous development and uh, also a very chaotic one uh, that uh, was uh, quite hard to stitch to one another. But we ended up with something uh, that you see here with, uh, again, uh, as the previous team did using the Vector platform to tie most of these things together, um, putting uh, the Autodesk uh, former uh, uh, development or taking the terrain and, and the environment and uh, simulating that and uh, pushing that then to the Vector platform for a calculation to be done. So that's, uh, uh, for that, we, did, we tried at least to do some uh, form of uh, uh, wind analysis and uh, ray tracing analysis and trying some weird things out. Uh, <laughs> There is a lot of expertise that I'm uh, not uh, too acquainted with, but uh, it uh, seemed to work uh, well in most cases and uh, tying them all together, which then allowed for then the results to be then sent through uh, for other analyses. For example, the reporting that you see here um, uh, to, to make it uh, as a, a pleasing report for others uh, to use. So if you want to send the report to a manager or so. Um, the stable diffusion model uh, was uh, developed here yeah, because why not? Uh, and then uh, it generates the results. Uh, maybe uh, you want to take over here? So the ambition here is really taking the parametric uh, generating, um, uh, sorry, uh, analysis, environmental analysis and connecting with kind of different design process so that you can possibly quickly run through different like massing options, uh, get the best environmental analysis, input into stable diffusion and render into something uh, 
and also leveraging the lightweight LoRa training model that is very quick to train, and then you can very be specific with what kind of style you want. And also the latest uh, 3D Gaussian splat generation all relies on the kind of base image to get better quality result of the 3D model. So the potential here is this can extend even further. So basically you will start from environmental analysis, massing into kind of a, some 2D image that you like, and then you can even start generating 3D models for you. So it's really kind of a full linear process in one. Yeah. So let's skip the first demo, which you have seen. Well, uh, I guess you all heard that uh, someone got uh, a bit bored yesterday. So they came over to us and joined our hackathon. Um, so here you see that last part where you have found your model and you just want to uh, not click all of those buttons or scripts inside of Rhino, just want to click one single button, simplicity, run it on this very I'm tiny running. model and get um, analyzes from clonation platform onto Forma and <laughs> I don't agree with single click. <laughs> Great job, guys. Really interesting. Uh, this quick question. Does it uh, fetch any updated uh, geometry from the initial platform? And pretty cool. So you mentioned optimization, right? You you you, you mentioned like an optimization process in. Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, we didn't have anyone joining that could do it. So <laughs> we were some software engineers who were writing like brute force for for loops. Yep. <laughs> I didn't concept. see any. New concept. Anything. <laughs> Um, so we are able to connect uh, stable diffusion with vector, so the user can have some kind of input. Uh, so basically, the idea is uh, you can have the image uh, take a screenshot from uh, Forma, and then it sends to vector, and then vector would send it to stable diffusion. Uh, can you guys go back to the uh, process uh, slide? So right now, Rhino, Shape Diver, and Forma are uh, the main geometry. Are there other uh, packages, platforms that could be used to integrate additional kinds of geometry? So basically, how the, all of this was strung together um, was uh, using Python and uh, leveraging the vector platform, allowing it to become a web-based application. Therefore allowing all these uh, different web-based platforms to communicate with one another. And ShapeDiver then also allowing for Rhino, which is uh, uh, not known as a web-based uh, platform, but then ShapeDiver allowing for that. So leveraging all these platforms uh, to their strengths, um, connecting them with one another, producing beautiful results. And everything is open. So speaking of Rhino not being known as a web-based platform, uh, <laughs> the folks who uh, I spent the last 25 hours hacking with, please come on up. And Sorry. some applause, maybe? I don't know. It's a big team, no? Yeah. You were the ones taking the company. <laughs> yeah. 
is there actually a limit to the increment, the number of points? Okay, yeah. So Rhino is great, partially because it plays well with others. You've got Rhino inside, which puts all of Rhino into other programs. And then you've got Rhino Compute, which can run invisibly in the cloud. But what if instead of running headless Rhino, you disembodied it? Rhino Anywhere is a floating head of Rhino, uh, which can be attached to any body. It's a framework for web developers to embed the front end of Rhino, you know, to embed the front end of Rhino using pixel string for lightweight and customizable modeling on the web. But why would you want Rhino in a browser or on a phone or a headset? Rhino Anywhere allows for radically different versions. Yes, you can already run Rhino on a laptop, but maybe you have a really big model and a Chromebook. What if you want to add direct modeling capability to a ShapeDiver app without having to custom build a, front, a bunch of widgets into the front end? Rhino Anywhere lets you customize Rhino by controlling the tools that the user has access to so that they might be limited to 2D drawing or just using meshes in a rendered mode. With Rhino Anywhere, you build your own version of Rhino so that it would make sense on a watch or on a phone or a fridge. Uh, but more importantly, for whatever app you're building without having to build it from scratch and on any browser-enabled device. All right, so in terms of the tech stack, uh, we start on the left-hand side here. We built a Rhino plugin that essentially turns your Rhino instance into a little server. So this is doing all of the heavy lifting, all of the geometry processing, and this can be a very beefy backend instance with a lot of resources. We're snatching rendered frames straight out of uh, Rhino's frame buffer. And we're using socket technology to just stream those rendered bitmaps to some sort of front-end application that can run on a web app or your phone or anything that can open a website. And we have our own um, JavaScript SDK that allows us to very quickly insert a streaming viewer into any application. And aside from sending bitmaps to the front-end, the front-end can also send commands, keystrokes, and mouse events back to the back end, so you actually retain all of the control uh, over the running Rhino instance. And live demo. OK, so this is the front door of our hack. You basically provide a URL, which points to the server that Sergey just talked about. You click on the Start Rhino Anywhere button. And here you see a 3D scene, which is basically very similar to Rhino. Um, you have all the commands that you would expect, like you can rotate, you can zoom in, you can pan. So you can probably select and drag things. You can even author things. So I'm creating a box, right? You can also use the keys to undo. And let's see, let's do a, we can actually do some more advanced modeling. You can draw a spline, for instance. Hopefully. Connected. Oh. Okay. Maybe. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. But you can also do some more advanced uh, geometry processing, such as um, uh, Booleans. So I'm going to select the, oh, thank you. All right, so <laughs> I'm selecting a piece of geometry here. I'll run the uh, Boolean difference, selecting another piece of geometry, and run the Boolean difference on a website. So we have another um, very quick little demo that we wanted to show. So this is um, running a 200 megabyte Rhino model uh, in a browser. So this would literally crash my um, browser if I try this. So um, yeah, it's a very thin layer of just a mechanism kind of receiving pixels and handling events back and forth to, uh, to the browser. 
And of course, where is beautiful software without beautiful people? These 10 wonderful developers hackers all joined together from eight different countries and representing seven different companies to come together to produce the Rhino Anywhere SDK. So it's available on, or will be when Barcelona wakes up, Food for Rhino. Um, it's available through the Rhino Package Manager Yak. You can see the GitHub organization, github.com slash Rhino Anywhere. And that contains the JavaScript SDK, example front end, and the uh, Rhino plugin. So please feel free to keep hacking. Any questions? Theoretically. Yep. So again, theoretically. I know something about multiple Rhino, Rhino instances, and uh, I think it's probably possible. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yes, very much so. <laughs> very good. <laughs> well, he's exactly, there you go. Any other questions? I'm always glad when what we create self exp Oh. This is view here for the front end. So we could alternate that for uh, a React JS or whatever other framework you would like instead. Just to also emphasize, these folks uh, built out a very nice, neat um, SDK, JavaScript SDK that can plug into any front end application, which is also open source. So if you guys want to check that out, uh, you can build your own stuff with that viewer. Uh, who is the ideal user for this? So the idea of being able to create any front end you want means there are a lot of niche applications and very interesting applications for an end users. Theoretically, you could create a nice little simplified Rhino that only has buttons for creating spheres and uh, rectangles for, say, small kids. Or even you could create maybe an input device that allows people who don't have the full use of their hands or their limbs, for example, to create anything in the geometry. I was going to suggest my four-year-old daughter, but I'll take that. Perfect. I, I would say it's comparable to an app configurator done with Vector, for example, right? Yeah, exactly. Just that you don't need to know, implement anything to, to deploy it just using Rhino. Yeah, exactly. And the browser is sending full commands. Each of those buttons you click sends a Rhino command. And you can type in that top bar any command. So you can do pretty much anything you want. Like a customized team viewer for Rhino. In theory, you can even use the plugins that are available to Rhino too. You could directly model with uh, Visual Arc or something as well. Well, that you might could... be harder for the four-year-olds. Uh, you, you could talk to Rhino, I suppose. You could talk to Rhino, like literally. Use your voice. If you wanted to. Sure. I already do. Anyway. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, yes. OK. So while this is coming up, um, oh, right anyway, that's us. All the way down, wherever you are, please uh, come on up. We're all here. Hello, uh, I'm Max, and along with these six other wonderful people, we are a team all the way down. And we built uh, reactive data pipelines for scalable rapid design. And we will explain what that means, but first I'll let Kian talk about why. Yeah, the jumping point, jumping off point for this was um, having some experience uh, delivering construction projects using a particular framework for developing the design, um, as well as the models. So if we use this building as an example, you know, you start with something really simple and you incrementally layer, add in layers of detail. As you go through the design, you figure things out. It's kind of these staged sequences of information that flows downstream as you kind of develop more and more complexity into the model all the way to the point where you get individual components that you can send to fabrication. So it has to be right. Your data pipeline for managing your information and the provenance of all that information has to be reliable. So the way we've done this in the past is that you have, we treat, this is kind of the mental model we use, which is you have these static files, these containers of information, and you have grasshopper scripts 
which process that information. They transform it, they combine it, they augment it, and you get this linear sequence and you actually represent the model of the whole building in all of the different states. You know, you maintain all the representations. What's tricky is as you get more and more complicated, you can't predict the end state of the graph from the beginning. It happens as you design. So it gets more and more complex. And by the time you get to the end of the whole project, you have this completely organic graph with all these relationships you never could have predicted from the beginning. The other problem is that if there's a change in the middle, you need to propagate all those downstream, which means opening tons and tons of Rhino files and grasshopper scripts and then having to fire them by hand and making sure your friend isn't doing it out of sync on the other side of the desk. Right, and so the keyword there is a graph. The, the graphs that we were showing before are the obvious mental model for how all of that stuff needs to be wired together. But the fact is that the computer doesn't actually know that that's a graph and that, that all those files are actually interdependent. Um, so what our idea was, was that we should do that. Uh, we should you know, figure out a way to annotate each of those files in this file-based workflow that might be coming from different tools um, and make it so that there is some kind of system on top of that that can be aware that like when file A changes, file B, C, D, E, F, G all need to change. Right? So for example, if you have a file further up in your design workflow that defines the floor height and that changes, you want to know that everything derived from the floor height and all those subsequent files is going to be updated and do so automatically. So that's what we built. Um, we focused on Rhino uh, and Grasshopper uh, uh, for um, this hackathon. Uh, so we built a Grasshopper plugin. It says four there, but really it should be all unified into one. Um, that basically makes it so that without modifying your Grasshopper workflow at all, it can automatically determine uh, what the inputs and outputs are for your Grasshopper scripts. Um, and you can monitor and control that uh, whole pipeline and execute everything that needs to be re-executed whenever one of your changes invalidates something. So we built a Rhino plugin so that we can check, like, uh, and it silently check all the user behavior so the user don't have to do much. And then we export this data and then we have a crawler that uh, collect all this data uh, so that we can push it to uh, DVC. Uh, and then we can generate a graph that is um, readable and friendly to the user so that they can understand um, the, the whole workflow, the whole part, workflow part that I've been working on. Yeah. So we realized that some of these projects can grow really large, really quickly. And then it's very difficult for a team to manage different as the dependencies of different of their different assets. So we also created an interactable um, graph based viewer so that you can actually see what assets are going through what workflow affected by what kind of grasshopper script. So this is what it looks like. So when you load the application, you can build the tree. So it crawls through all of the little notes that have been saved by the Rhino plugin, which records what the inputs and outputs are, compiles those notes into a continuous tree, which is what we just saw. It computes which parts of that tree need to be updated based on the kind of underlying version control platform. And then it builds you a project, a, a job, a batch list of the files in the correct sequence based on the organization that has organically grown as you've been working. And this is what that looks like. That's in the browser. So you could kind of theoretically build a dashboard around that that multiple people could look at. And then here it's running through a series of updates and it's going to do like a solar analysis and change the dimension of the shades on the outside, for example, in a kind of sequence, stage sequence of models. Cool. Yeah. So what's the impact of this? Um, well, like we said, keeping all those file-based workflows like in sync, especially as they continue to grow in complexity, is very difficult, especially when you're working with different tools that might not know anything about each other. Um, by making that flow of information explicit, you can leverage a lot of design intelligence. Like I said, we all have that graph model in our head when we're working with all these files, but by making the computer know about it, so much more things become automatable. And this lets you implement design changes much more quickly and with and reliably with less risk of discrepancies, et cetera, et cetera. Important thing to note is that there's no configuration, no new websites, servers, anything like that, no changes to your workflow, really. Um, so next steps, we would want to integrate with other tools. Uh, this can also integrate with external APIs. It's built on top of Git semantics. So anything like branching, committing that would like really facilitate larger scale collaboration is possible if you can make it user friendly enough for your people. And then we are open source. We got a great readme. You can run this. Instructions are online. Scan the QR code. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I'm, I love it. I on many sites. Um, I one of the things that I, that I, that I do is basically graph machine learning. That, that I'm into, and I think this this project falls right into 
uh, augmenting the possibilities of actually being able to process um, the same data as, as graphs. You know? um, one question, though, do you draw uh, specifically have to prescribe the, the relationship in between nodes? No, we do not. No. So basically, with most of these grasshopper scripts, at least in the in the design methodology that that Kian has been working in, which is he worked we worked off of one of his projects, uh, the inputs and the outputs are annotated explicitly in the grasshopper scripts. So you don't really need to think about the graph itself specifically. So you're just, match, no? The grasshopper script just says I take this in, and I output this, and then all the dependencies are wired up automatically to make the graph. Just the particulars are. In this workflow, we're using Elefront. So it, the Elefront components know what, they know what an input node is and an output is. So like the reference component gets registered in that little text file. It's like, oh, well, I know I have an input here. I'll break a record. I know I have an output thing here. I'll make a record. And so the person using it doesn't have to know anything about any of that. The script builds the tree from those little tiny notes. Yeah, the key thing is you don't have to leave Grasshopper and you don't have to at any point be thinking about the whole larger graph. What about modifying the specific parts of the graph? So if you want to change one of the scripts for something completely different. Yeah, so the 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 um, algorithm that we're building on top of is able to recognize changes at the node level and then invalidate all of the sub nodes in the graph that you know descend from that. It so tell you whether it crashes or everything else, basically. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or and if it doesn't crash, it'll update everything. Yeah. Super exciting, guys. Uh, more of a suggestion than a question. I, I would like to see you guys uh, develop the back, uh, or rather the end. Uh, can I continue just real quick? Uh, I got, I'm sorry, I got the mic. Uh, no, I, I would like to see, uh, say, for example, design for manufacturing assembly, where you can get explicit or weighted suggestions uh, up, up front as opposed to downstream. And that's probably uh, dependent on a, an extensive library of off-the-shelf units that begin to then help you engineer uh, in, in concept and even schematic. But really great. Wonderful. Thanks. Now, how I was joking about uh, solving every single problem in AEC yesterday. I think we're getting pretty close. All right. Um, EZRX. Oh, you guys are already here. Wow. Okay. All right. Um, well, probably need like more than one mic. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello everyone. We're team Easy Script, Easy Prescription. It's quite clever. My name's Christopher. I'm a software developer. And I'm Travis, a MEP software developer. My name is Marcelo. I am a computer science graduate. Hi, my name is Haki. I'm a computer science junior. Hi, I'm Sun. Uh, I'm a computational designer. Hello, my name is Emma, and I'm an undergraduate architecture student. Hi, let's go. Work faster. <laughs> I can't. This is so hard. I'm doing everything manually. I've never tried Grasshopper before, and I don't have this time to learn it. Exactly. I think I need a software mentor. Somebody said software mentor. Woo! <laughs> okay, can you show me how this works? This is going to be going to be very easy for you. Uh, you're going to have a user interface within Rhino. You're going to have your own personal assistant. 
And you can interact with it. So you can see that it's very hard to start from something that is uh, unique, and it will run directly into the graph. Ooh, is there? <laughs> can someone actually show me how to use this? Say, I have a deadline. <laughs> yeah, so this is the, the demo here. Um, you know, you can do a lot of things. You can talk to it. You can ask for whatever you want. You know, let's say you just want to, you know, start from the beginning and you're just going to ask for a cube. So you write into the prompt here, create a cube. And uh, Ezrex is going to go ahead and interpret that. And it's going to send you back a perfectly formatted uh, C Sharp script that can run and then be uh, uh, compiled. And it will create you a cube, right? So what do you think of that cube? Cube is super simple. Can you show me something more complex about um, a tetrahedron? Yeah, let's see. Let's see if you could do a tetrahedron. So we're just going to do the same thing. Go and write, create a tetrahedron. It's a very simple prompt. Um, and then you have a chance, once it's created it, to really inspect the code. And it looks about right. That's probably what I would write. So let's go ahead and uh, press uh, you know, exit out. And there we go. Look at that nice little tetrahedron. So I mean, I hope that satisfies you. I hope that's all. Is there anything else you need to see? Wait, so that means if I um, put in a word and it can actually generate the form for me, I wonder if I can get a, um, let's say, donut. Uh, let's give it a try. Yeah, so if you type in uh, create a donut as a, as a mesh uh, with a radius of like 10, let's, let's say it does that. So, uh, you know, fingers crossed, you know, product manager, hopefully this works. Uh, yeah, um, it looks like it. Hopefully it runs. Let's see. Yeah, it runs perfectly. Woo! Great. Yeah, so uh, um, okay. all this code was uh, run, uh, compiled uh, directly from ChatGPT. Nothing, nothing changed. So. What, what if I want like a SpongeBob? Uh, uh, can you give Chris, me a, maybe can you help me out here? <laughs> okay, so we've hit the limit of what we were able to achieve within 24 hours. Just like here in the room, there was applause when we achieved the, the Taurus. Um, we were motivated by the fact that when people uh, have programming to do, they don't have enough time to become programmers when it's uh, immediately upon them. And we realize that people are using tools like ChatGPT, but the problem is, uh, we were explained to us, is that ChatGPT isn't producing code that is immediately runnable within the context of, let's say, a grasshopper script. And the problem is for a new programmer, how do you figure out what to do to the code to make it work? And how do you get ChatGPT to produce good code? So we decided to create a tool that would basically use prompt engineering to manufacture a good prompt to send to ChatGPT. So the team here created three main uh, components. One was the interface that would communicate with ChatGPT, modify the prompt because the users just want to write something simple, so they simplified it. Next step train ChatGPT to produce more forms, uh, understand more context of, of uh, Rhino code. And, and that's it, it's a great achievement. So congratulations team. So Christopher, uh, what open source projects did you use and how much did you create during this context? We used the ChatGPT uh, APIs right off of open source. We used Roslyn, which is an open source C-sharp compiler. We had a little bit of code to simplify the interface because we had to create a C-sharp scripting to take arbitrary code and run it within Grasshopper. So we can use the same node to recompile code on the fly. Any other questions? That would have saved him a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, so we basically created a Grasshopper node using the API that would call the C-sharp compiler to compile the code that we had to parse and script. A lot of magic happened in the back end to make this happen, yeah. That's, that's the tricky part is you have to extract the code from the prompt because a prompt would often give you text, explain the code. So we had to say, no, don't ex explain the code to us. Just give us the code. And then we have to take the code and somehow put it into the note. 
And little engineering problems like this that the team were able to solve. We are really going out of the way for anyone who just doesn't have any experience scripting, who is being told they have to script. And so they are, are trying to, to figure out for the first time. And we all know that like having working code in front of you is probably the easiest way of learning how to code and like me messing with it. So getting something that works and then you can tweak it over time and, and talk to it. And like getting that barrier of entry as low as low as possible. So we said that the uh, person who's using this tool should just be able to know how to open Grasshopper and that's the extent of their, their knowledge. And that's where we, that's where we started. Yeah, we thought about that as well. Yeah, but it was just easy to uh, do it this way. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm gonna return us to the jurors. And all right, uh, folks from Find It, please come up. All right. You guys just telepathically know to be here. That's that's really convenient, actually. Yeah. Hi. Oh, okay. Oh, it's difficult to be on this side. Okay. So, hi. Uh, we are going to present you uh, Find It. Thank you. So, of course, Find It uh, stands for uh, Forestry Identification and Navigation for Digital Imagining Transfer. So this is a team, uh, yeah, and we're coming from different parts of, of the world. Um, so um, in the era of generative AI, why architects are, uh, and engineers are still spending time trying to generate information that is already there, 3D masing for, from uh, hand drawings or uh, images. Uh, we saw uh, a few examples today and we thought about how can we uh, empower architects with uh, engineers with computer vision and AI so we can liberate, liberate them from manual labor, unleashing their fully potential. Uh, so we started by researching uh, projects that already exist, such as uh, computer vision AI. We have uh, Segment Anything from Meta. We have OpenCV. We have public uh, data uh, from satellites from Google and Microsoft. So the idea is to change this, the existing workflow. So we have, we receive a hand, uh, hand drawn uh, 2D, we receive a sketch, we receive a, an image, and we just cry a little bit. And then we try somehow to put in caffeine and get a 3D mazing on the other side of the, of the bat. So what we propose to solve this? So the first, um, the first solution that we propose is, uh, First tool called Schedule Three D um, by utilizing the uh, the consistency uh, value of a hand sketch, we will be able to use some of that matching to identify certain um, a sample image to find all that element existing in the sketch. Um, so this is uh, a little bit of how it works. So this is typical situation from my office. I just got the sketch of a concept and I need to build a 3D model, for example, for a radiation daylighting study. So you just seen I sampled from that sketch a template, one tree, and this algorithm recognizes on a picture all similar trees to that one. And you can see because I like repeat every time some like style, it recognizes trees. It recognized almost everywhere, every tree, if I want to recognize more, I can just resample another tree, uh, go for a second run, and probably I will get all of them. So this is our experience with like different types of, uh, of sketch style and experience with different threshold to achieve like um, adjustable result. So our idea was how we can uh, leverage the power of image processing and make it super accessible for the architects and designers. So we have open sourced the most uh, updated uh, object an uh, analysis algorithm, which is called the segment analysis model, uh, a segment anything model. So uh, when we try to automate a site model or when we try to get some site information, many obstacles is like we don't know where are the trees or where are the roads are. Sometimes we get some lighter information and try to get information from that, but that's super lengthy process. But if you can try to process the image, the image has all the information. So the architects and designers have to have the power to grab all the information and just have it in Rhino. So we have our 
site model and from the site model we uh, track the tree position it can be any other uh, prompt it can be building it can be roads Inji. so our prompt was tree then we got the tree position and just uh, transferred the information in rhino so it's a seamless process we use the huge model and try to get the uh, centroid yeah we'll go super fast so this Video shows exactly what Anik just mentioned. We are going to start with Grasshopper and Rhino, and we can call the Flask API, which whose segment anything model. So we can call the API, not in this demo video, but in the future, and then we can get the results from the segment anything model, and we can generate the tree messing as um, you know Powell just showed before. Okay, so on the other side, we're seeing the same thing, but this time communicating through Dynamo. So we are talking with the Flask API. The model is running here. You can see that the model is actually running. It's doing the prediction. It takes some time to run because it's a large model, but you can have the results around this. Yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah. You wanna you wanna end it up? Yeah. So uh, our intention was how we can uh, access the most uh, or open source the most uh, wonderful model available and give architects and designers get, have the powers of image processing in Rhino. That's all. Thank you. Oh, at last we found it. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. So from uh, in our office framework, we have GIS engineers that give us the height map so we can uh, when we have everything in the Rhino environment, we can overlap this information and get more accurate and detailed uh, configuration of the tree or anything you want from the site. Uh, yeah, I think your own point. So our algorithm identifies the, you know, the assets on the 2D image, right? So after we identify the like X, Y coordinates of those assets, we can plug in those hype map data or like open source, whatever, like contour data so that we can, you know, combine those data to X, Y, Z, and then we can generate the messing to the right height. All right, we found it. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, amazing stuff. My, my follow-up question is, uh, where were you guys during my thesis year? That <laughs> would have been really useful. All right. Wasted. That's you. Here you go. All right. So we're wasted, and it's not because we hit the liquor cabinet. Uh, before this presentation, as one may assume by that uh, icon there, but it's because in our world today of produce, use, and throw away, we're all over the limit on waste. Um, so to, to solve this global problem, we have a global team. We're representing five different industries, construction, structural engineering, architecture, IoT, and computational design uh, from seven different countries. Our mission is to unlock value in existing end of service buildings. How do we get to reduce this waste? Next slide. Some numbers, 600 million tons of CND waste, uh, construction and demolition waste in 2018. To give you perspective, 300 million is what everyone else generates outside of that industry. So we're double that. 66% uh, of that alone is just concrete. So if you have a good use for used concrete, you'll be a millionaire, billionaire. Uh, Global uh, or uh, greenhouse gas impacts, uh, we're also 8% created by cement, 7% by uh, production of steel. So big space there. How do we solve this? Uh, we heard new design concepts, reduced material, great thoughts. How do we deal with it from the existing building side? Uh, next slide. Most ideally, don't take it down. How can we repurpose the existing spaces we have? Nazar is here to tell us how. We can start by doing some structural analysis. Of course, we need to optimize the design, optimize it. So what we built here started with a four-story steel moment frame building, uh, commercial type. Uh, we see in New York City right here, very difficult to convert from commercial to residential. So we wanted to do to work on some optimizations. 
So what we did really here is to uh, design this building to begin with uh, for the ASCE 7 code. And then uh, we have constraints of stability, of course, first, and then how much load we can use on the green space of the roof. We wanted to convert roofs to green spaces. That's the most optimum way to reconfigure the spaces. That's number one. So in order to do that, we have uh, built a structural analysis model in SAP API. Then we used uh, a Python code to open the model, uh, put some loading conditions on the roof, uh, and then start optimizing. If it doesn't work, we have to take out more, uh, more load from it, uh, go down, and then optimize, uh, go to the next bay, see if it can work, and uh, do a loop between Python and, uh, and, and SAP API in order to come up with the optimum uh, loading scenarios for this roof condition. Um, from that, uh, we can, uh, the next step we wanted to look at was to um, optimize spaces like this one right here. If we wanted to introduce um, lighting in the space so we can look at next uh, into glass, structural glass in terms of uh, loading scenarios as, scenarios as well, just like we did on the roof. All right, if we can't repurpose it, how do we unlock value in what's there? All right. So in addition to structural analysis and simulation, we use a variety of technologies to uh, capture real-time data of the building, its materials, and uh, estimate the cost of those materials and plug those into interactive applications that a user can use to visualize the data and make assessments as far as uh, what direction to move forward. Uh, so we start off by using a mobile SLAM scanner to get a point cloud model of a small section of the office as well as panoramic images. And uh, that data is fed into a uh, computer vision model where we're uh, classifying the materials that are in the images. For our functional prototype, we use Google Vision's API to get uh, general uh, labels of the materials. And then we use ChatGPT's API to dynamically filter the uh, materials and get some uh, idea of the uh, ways that they can be repurposed. Uh, so with better algorithms, like uh, specifically trained models, we can uh, get even more, uh, like better information, or if they're more generalized, we can get better data. So here we are using ChatGPT4's uh, image recognition API, or image recognition feature, which does not have an API just yet. And we're able to get a lot more detailed information specific to our use case. Uh, from there, we use a mobile application uh, made with Unity to visualize the point cloud information. And uh, next slide. Uh, we can also validate the labels that we get from the vision model and even add uh, more uh, metadata, such as uh, quantities and volumes, where we can do a cost analysis, for which I'll uh, hand off to Jared. Well, yeah, so um, you might not be able to scan an entire building, uh, so you might just do one floor. So one way to supplement that information is through some sort of quick massing study. So this is just another kind of input in order to get more uh, quantity information. And so with that, coupled with the input from kind of that visual uh, uh, ML kind of model, we would get some keywords for the materials that it's seeing. Um, and that's connected to, uh, we found an, uh, uh, an API called the one build API, which has the cost information. So this is, um, kind of a, a, a sample web app that is functional, at least until the trial to that API ends in a couple of weeks. Um, but basically, this is kind of how you would visualize uh, a lot of that cost data and map it. Um, the roadmap. All right, any questions? summarize so you can scan a space extract information from it such as materials and and such forth and then get recommendations uh, and then there's analysis for loading conditions and so on but then get recommendations for uh what can be recycled up used reduced yada 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 so on exactly yeah we we're pulling cost estimating uh, from an open source uh open sourced uh, database that can then map to what uh, was being visually recognized by the data. And then you get an output of what you can do with it. And hopefully it starts a conversation and get more creative on what we can do with all this waste. Um, so it highly, highly relies on the, on the accuracy of detecting materials, right? In, in, and I just wanna, um, wanna ask 
as how you got a feeling of how reliable it was actually from from scanning the office because some materials are actually yeah. not visible now. So the the Google API was simple, like floor, ceiling, light. When you plugged in Chat GPT four, which was just released a couple weeks ago, it was getting down to rivets on columns, fireproofing, polishing on the floor. It got very accurate very fast. So we think we would have talked about it in the next steps. But as those models, those AI models get better, you can do a lot more with it. And as reality capture gets better. So this is just the start. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Fantastic. So we only have a couple teams left. And uh, Clippy AI, right? Let's uh, send some applause their way as well. Hello, hello. We have not yet started. Plugging in? Okay. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. We are Clippy AI. Um, does anyone remember Clippy? I don't know. Kind of like, wow. Okay, we are in the right crowd. All right. Uh, we're not going to go over all of this. Feels like uh, Chat GPT's more than half uh, computes might have been from participants in this room this weekend. But anyway, simple rabbit queries, long time, many, many clicks. Sad face, sad face part two, QC or model or else. All right, problem, problem, problems. Hack, hack, hack. Okay, this is the fun part. Early thoughts. So we were thinking like, how do we get ChatGPT to do stuff? Like, does it return code that actually something understands? We started uh, thinking about ideas where we take the code, parse it through, tell it like explicitly, no, 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 give us like really base calls to the Revit API because the API is already janky. If you give it like entire code, it's gonna crash. Uh, but uh, fortunately it gives really good code. So a lot of our work was actually done by GPT instead of us. Anyway, so this is like showing some early sketching. What do we do with the client side, server side, all that jazz, you know it all. Wireframing, this is the fun part. So. Initially, we were just a team of two looking for people, and then we had more reinforcements, and we had like lovely UI designers, and everything just started looking way more profesh. This is the architecture, client application, target platform, local side, remote side, cloud, 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 machine, machine, machine. Data goes, data goes, black magic happens there, data comes back, voodoo is happening in the target platform. Front-end in Spyro, real retro theme out there. We wanted Clippy, we did not want to let go of Clippy. Let's meet Clippy again. All right, first half an hour, we were trying to figure out how to get a GIF inside a WPF form. Fun, anyway, that has to be there. So now let's make the program. All right, we got all the other fun stuff in there, but Clippy doesn't look official. Let's make it TT Clippy. <laughs> this is our final UI. Uh, we've got some tabs in there. We're gonna talk more about it, uh, but we want to show you the demos, so I'm running through this. All right, nailed it. Context prompts, so uh, feed Clippy context prompts before each session, because otherwise it really does not know how to use the API. It'll give you some stuff from like 2020, 2018, doesn't work with Revit. We kind of have to put guardrails around it, say like, here's all the good stuff, here's all the bad stuff. Don't even think about converting units. Everything is in feed, life is good. Exceptions, <laughs> poor Clippy. There will be exceptions, catch them early, don't show them to your users. As long as they don't see the screen of that, we're good. All right, danger. Yeah, you can actually do this, delete the model and delete my open model and all elements in it, and it will freaking do it. <laughs> we were like, oh my God. <laughs> all right, <laughs> after passing the exceptions, a lot of cases, responses keep getting better and better, and finally it works. We were scratching our head. How do we improve this thing? We said, you know what? Copy and paste the damn thing back to of chat GPT, it actually keeps improving itself. Wonderful, we don't wanna do that infinitely. So we're like, let's just cap it at like five times, 10 times, gets better every time. All right, more future work. More future work is basically, it, it can't go to the web, scrape all the fun API docs. What we're gonna do is like scrape all that stuff, download it, put it in the file, here, take more context, here, take more context. Literally last night at like 1 a.m., 
we were sitting out here we're like feed it feed it feed it it's like a fire all right putting clippy to work query the model okay so what all can we do we can count columns and print results some fun stuff in there uh, should we run through that maybe like skim through it we'll see so what do we do we've got a model we're doing columns placing some dummy columns in there because we didn't have columns in our model yeah, can you believe that? The sample model doesn't have nice selectable for columns. What are we doing? All right, that's the prompt. That's our initial prototype thing. It gives back the number. I don't know if you can see it. It's doing like attempts and stuff. Ultimately, it gives us back like numbers in there. All right, next. Move, moving, moving, moving. Count columns, count walls. Skip that, my buddy says. All right, trust us, it works. Make some changes. This is fun, right? Like you've got all these grids. This is like the video showing how long it takes to just draw like a grid of lines, blah, blah, blah. Manual testing and prompt engineering. So the first thing we did was like, can we draw grids? Like, let's just start low, low, low hanging fruit. Um, all right, initially we just went to the web, um, got in some response, tried putting it in here, got like really small grids. And we were like, oh, can you make that really big? It's also polite. I apologize for the oversight. Wow. All right, so let's make some grids, longer grids, perfect. Now it's like, can you do like 15 feet apart, all that fun stuff? I don't know if the video will go all the way to the end this time, but we should get like after grids, see a nice, lovely landing with grids. There you go. That's like literally talking to this guy. All right, I'm going to skip through this. Let's go to a demo. We're going to click on, wait for the second. Pause the timer. Pause the timer. All right. We click on the chat button. If it comes up, we're good to go. Okay. So now we're going to put in this prompt, find all the walls in the model, and return the total length of the walls. We're going to hit submit. It's going to do some stuff. I'm going to wait. Fired <laughs> already. <laughs> Okay, and oh boy. Okay, okay, that's all right. We got an attempt. It's making a second attempt. So it didn't work. Uh, it did not like the third attempt either. Okay, that's uh, -oh. uh, what are the odds? This is working like five minutes. This is not recorded. This is really live, and we're like sweating through this. <laughs> to the debug menu. All right, can I click down through here? Oh. All right, you can see the code that it's generating. Came back, came back, no? No. Did it come back? Oh, he says it's capped at three. I told him not to run the live demo. Anyway. <laughs> we also had a video where it said, change all the rooms to room names to confusing names, and it made all of them confusing one, confusing two, confusing three. Then we also said like sequentially do blah, 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 blah. That's basically boring labels. And then we got like room one, room two, room three, and life was good again. So that's Clippy. Um, all right, what do you say? We'll try a different one. All right, so I'm fed up with these walls. I've had enough. Let's delete them all. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Maybe I ask some questions in the meantime. Yeah, please feel free to start thinking funny questions. Should we relieve the, the pressure a bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that danger was for real, man. <laughs> 10 seconds for questions. Good, bad, yay, no. Yeah, what's the, what's right. the error checking? Um, yeah, he can. Uh, we'll just answer one quick in five seconds. So one of the most interesting discoveries with this was that iterating and making it retry on the code and sending it back with the error that it had, it would learn and just improve the code based on that. So it does multiple tries. It kind of goes on autopilot and yeah, and end up um, either getting to a result or maxing out the attempts. That the user can like set up the max number of items on the top. And if it gets there and it didn't get a result, it just stops. And if it does, uh, well, 
everyone's happy, I guess. Also, early context that we feed it. We also ask ChatGBT if they can actually write the code and if there's enough information. So if you say move the column to the right, but you don't put a distance, it'll send back to you missing information. And, ask, and then you can reprompt it, add that distance, and then it'll actually run. Um, so. <laughs> It's got a mind of its own. All right, can I get that yes. back? Um. <laughs> All right, that's the uh, that's the magic of a of a hackathon live demo. Okay, so last but not least, um, folks from Ramit, do you guys need this? Okay, great. Here we go. Cheers. All right. Um, great presentation, Abhishek, who was supposed to be in our group, but water under the bridge. Um, our project is called Ramit. It's a tool that talks uh, that it, that provides us to um, uh, bring geometry from Revit into a software called Ram Concept, which is a structural uh, engineering software for slab designs. Um, we had a very diverse team, like a lot of other groups. Uh, this <laughs> this image is by chat gpt <laughs> um we i'll just i just skip through a lot of stuff <laughs> okay um so the motivation for us was really uh we have a lot of great tools uh in our toolkit you know we have rhino 8 we have revit we have ram concept we have grasshopper um we, they are really advanced they have really good uh advanced technology that we can use but as you saw before, <laughs> um, our current work workflow is not so great. We are not leveraging all those technologies. We are not using Grasshopper enough. All right. So the goal was basically to develop an inter interoperability tool between Revit and RAM concept. That was the simple goal. And how we do that, next one, please. Um, we basically want to take advantage of the Revit uh, and Rhino, and between that, we were using Rhino inside Revit. That's full inter interoperability there. And then between Rhino and RAM concept, we're using the API that RAM concept just uh, uh, released two years ago, and seems like nobody was using it so far. So we want to use one way. We don't. We're not totally sure if we can do the trip back yet, but that's in there. Yeah. So. In uh, Rev using R Rhino inside Revit, we just queried uh, the important model components like the slabs, columns, and walls that are used for RAM concept. And we got the important coordinate information as inputs. Uh, this would be a great task for Clippy <laughs> to help out with. So this is a final product. We, have, we just developed during the night these five uh, components that let you basically create a new RAM concept file or interact with an existing one. Another component that helps you draw slabs, draw columns, draw walls, and draw openings. Now, let's... Uh, on the right side, it shows the Revit model, and on the left side, it shows the RAM concept model. Our tool transfers the Revit model to the RAM concept model. Then live demo. So we have a, uh, a structural Revit model here, and uh, we are just going to um, use Rhino inside Revit to, uh, to get the geometry from the Revit model. Um, I'm just going to create a file name here, um, 219pm, and that's it. It should take one of the slabs. Uh, I didn't show, but we, we can use the slider to select which slabs to choose. Right now, we are selecting the first level. And it should create a model in just a second. A couple more seconds. Okay. 
that's the model it just created, um, which is again, as I said, it's a structural analysis software, um, and that's that's a slab it brought from um, from Revit, which is exactly uh, the same. That's now, lab. now I'm just gonna show you what uh, what we can do if we um, just let me just edit this um, slab to be more realistic. Sorry. All right, and it should in real time update my RAM concept file in the background, hopefully. There you go. Um, just to finalize, uh, it is open source and you can find a future roadmap. You can read that. It's, it's in there and it's an open source project so you can just find it on GitHub. Yep. Um, so I'm not sure what the what the the role of Grasshopper is there. Basically, is is it just basically as a UI? Because uh, couldn't you in theory just connect? Um, if, if it's a Python API, you can do it straight from Revit, right? Um, I think we we are using Rhino inside Revit to make it more easier to grab geometry from Revit, and then right. uh, Rhino eight has this Python um, uh, uh, script editor. So we just yeah. and. Uh, RAM concept API is completely in Python, so that worked well for us. Yes, the brand new one. Yeah. <laughs> File or are you actually sorry, not the Python file, are they, the RAM file, or are you calling RAM headlessly to generate the file? We can do both. It can be headlessly or it can generate the file. We had both options. Yeah, I was wondering because I didn't see RAM open there. Yeah, in this case, uh, we, we had an option that says do it without opening. It was. Thank you. All right, folks. All right, so the jury has spoken. I have the results in my hand. Um, so we'll start with honorable mentions. And um, first of all, uh, safe, safe GPT receives an honorable mention. Um, AE Academy as well. Good job, guys. Now, another round of applause goes to Boring. And of course, one and only Clippy AI. All right. So now, starting with the best collaborative hack, Rhino Anywhere. All right, do you guys want to come up on stage and Oh, 
Uh, yeah, Rhino Anywhere, great job, guys. I think for us, it was a very challenging uh, deliberation. I think the honorable mentions were right up in the thick of things. So, you know, as, as, as you guys know, we don't have a whole lot of time. So we had to kind of cram the, the end of that. But uh, best collaborative, uh, congratulations. Uh, I think Rhino Anywhere, there's definitely an immediate future uh, application for this. And not to mention the kind of external uh, inputs that could begin to allow more users to, to use the software. So really great job, guys. All right. Yeah, that's literally the only thing we ask you <laughs> here for. So, um, OK, uh, next up, best open source, Fern E. All right. So uh, uh, for me, um, one thing that um, we really like about this particular project was that um, first, it was one of the apps that was not trying to kind of uh, focus on specialists, but rather opening kind of a really useful case for everybody else. So the impact that this tool can have is massive potentially. Mm -hmm. Also, the fact that it's open, I think, just multiplies that you know, exponentially. You know, so uh, we really believe that you know this this is something that can actually hit the market quickly and and solve you know many 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 problems and not uh, don't want to forget that um, the reason why this can have an impact and it's not a bad impact um, is that um, it kind of opens the the level of reality that some you know most of the time kind of AI generative images can can have so uh, so it's something kind of uh, really needed and, and I think uh, with with lots of value. So, Congratulations. And now, all the way up at the summit of Mount Olympus, that is the AC Tech Hackathon events, is uh, all the way down. So when it, this is definitely an arm wrestling match in the back room, um, without a doubt, because there's so many awesome projects. But with regards to this project, so some of the few things that, that stood out uh, significantly was that uh, this ability to start to track sort of actions within the design process, right? Not just tracking files or tracking versions of files, but starting to track processes, right? Which was pretty interesting. And then being able to graph that out and understand the interdependency between the processes, which is something that typically is embedded within our, as designers, our experience and our minds, right? We know what the what is because we can see it in files and documents, but you can never really understand the why within that interdependency. And that's why, that's why we thought this, was, this had uh, some pretty good legs. I don't know if anybody else wants to. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, thank you very much, too. Let's uh, give a round of applause to our jurors. And yeah, uh, that's it. Thanks to all the teams. Also, uh, don't forget about the extra prizes uh, kindly provided by uh, Shimizu. Um, there are only three sets, so basically the fastest and most aggressive wins. <laughs> so, you know, you figure it out. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody.